So I guess first, thanks so much for inviting me to talk about the Oregon Kelp Alliance and talk about kelp in Oregon in general. And I'm going to sort of move some things around here so that I can see what I'm talking about. There you go. Uh, yeah, so I guess I'll just uh, uh, give you a quick overview. I'm going to take about 30 minutes or so. I'm going to talk about uh, the Oregon Cup Alliance, what, what it is, who we are, what are we doing, why are we here. I'm going to talk a little bit about kelp itself and about kelp forests. Uh, I'm going to talk about some of the, uh, what we've started to call kind of a perfect storm situation where we're seeing changes in the kelp forests off the coast of Oregon and, and why that might be happening. And then I'll be talking about some of the projects that the Kelp Alliance is involved in right now, some work we did this summer, and some of the things we have planned for the coming year. And then we'll have time for uh, questions and answers. So uh, before I move off this title slide, I uh, just want to point out to you what you're seeing here in the three, uh, the three photos. One is of a small stand of kelp forest that remains off nearby Humbug Mountain in a place that has uh, changed quite a bit over the last few years. The middle photo is actually uh, your guy, Tom McCambridge, uh, during his uh, immersive internship that he did here last summer. That's him at the Redfish Rocks Marine Reserve. And the third photo is one of, a, 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 I guess I'll call it a gathering of purple sea urchins in nearby Titchener Cove. And uh, those are the kind of densities we're seeing. I'll show you other photos of those as we go through the presentation. But just to give you a bit of a visual on some of the players that we're talking about. And now I have to navigate my, there we go. So, uh, so who's the Oregon Kelp Alliance? Uh, this is a, a diverse group of, in, of folks who are interested in the health, uh, health of the kelp forest along the Oregon coast. And it includes uh, commercial urchin divers and other kinds of divers, scientific divers, uh, conservation groups, um, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, shellfish biologists, uh, even chefs, and uh, tribal members, eco tour guides. So we really uh, gathered together from uh, multiple different perspectives, but all with a shared interest in the health of the kelp forest that uh, we either work in or around or study or somehow are engaged in. And I always like to give credit where it's due in situations like this. And in this case, uh, I want to acknowledge that it was commercial urchin divers who really started to bring this problem to our attention. Because that obviously, by definition, they spend a good amount of time working day after day in uh, multiple different locations on the Oregon coast, from Rogue Reef off Cold Beach, to Orford Reef off Port Orford, to uh, Simpson Reef up in Charleston, and up to Depot Bay. Uh, they've worked up and down the coast in the kelp forest, which is where the uh, sea urchin habitat is. And that's where things start to get complicated. And I'll talk about that later. So in the photos here, you're seeing a pretty healthy red sea urchin harvest on the left on the fishing vessel Mach 1. And to the right, Orford Reef, which has been the primary harvest location for urchin divers for many years. Uh, but more recently has not been producing marketable sea urchin for many of the reasons I'll be talking about, but fundamentally because of a loss of urchin food, which is kelp. And I should mention that I actually worked on, uh, Tom mentioned this, but I worked on the, on, on the Mach 1 as a commercial fisherman in the, in the sea urchin fishery for several years and have just maintained those relationships, which led to some of the initial contacts. Not sure how to go back. There you go. Okay, so what, what the heck is a kelp? Um, you know, we throw this word around, but not, not everyone quite understands what it is we're talking about. Uh, these are large, uh, in the case we're talking about, large brown marine seaweed, uh, technically an algae, not a plant, but they do photosynthesize like plants. And they uh, like to live in cool, shallow waters in the near shore and about, appear in about a quarter of the world's coastlines. So they're pretty prevalent around the world. And the things we're seeing here are being seen around the world as well. 
And then why should we talk about kelp in the first place? Um, so I like to really emphasize that what we're really talking about is a foundation species that gives rise to an entire ecosystem that we call a kelp forest. And that has, uh, there are a lot of reasons why that matters and is important. And I'll just point out a few here, uh, very important to fisheries. Uh, many fish species, particularly commercial, commercially important species and others depend on that kelp forest habitat, uh, both as juveniles where they find shelter and food in the kelp forest and also as adults where again, they, they shelter and use that cover to, uh, to seek out food and uh, seek shelter from predators. Uh, it's also important as a food source for many species as the kelp degrades or sometimes sloughs off, pieces of it break off and settle out into the, into the habitat below and becomes food for many different organisms. Uh, it subsidizes the systems on the shoreline. You've probably all seen these bunches of kelp that wash up during the storms that occur this time of year and into the winter. And as that breaks down, it feeds many organisms that live on the beach. And so that's a major source of nutrients. Of course, fisheries, as I mentioned, many fisheries are uh, very much dependent on healthy kelp forests. Uh, here we're talking, we're seeing the urchin boat that I showed you earlier. So yeah, sure, the sea urchin fishery is, is uh, definitely directly linked to the kelp forest, but so are many other species, particularly ground fish uh, fisheries like rockfish, lingcod, cabazon, greenling, and other species, and uh, many different one, many different uh, species use that habitat. Obviously, recreation and tourism rely on that healthy habitat because it creates habitat for other organisms that are of interest, like whales and sea lions, etc. And also, just uh, like this nice shot of a, a snorkeler, just enjoying the kelp forest for its own, you know, for its own value. Uh, it can be an incredibly uh, rich and wonderful place to explore. And then uh, carbon sequestration is another thing that we are learning about kelp forests and how uh, they produce, uh, sorry, they result in a pretty significant amount of sequestration. Here's a diagram that I uh, borrowed from Jensen and Duarte's paper from 2016 in Nature, sort of showing you kind of a diagram of how that all works. How does the kelp end up uh, at the bottom of the ocean? Uh, but it, it does, not all of it washes up on the beach. So a significant portion of it ends up in the deep ocean and being buried and taking all of that carbon with it. Uh, the, bull kelp, the bull kelp that we uh, typically see here uh, grows extremely rapidly. It has a, roughly a one year life cycle and it grows to that great length you see in that one year. So that's a very fat, fast growth rate. And so in the process, it's sucking up a lot of carbon. In, and uh, when it sinks to the bottom, it's taking that carbon with it. And uh, the estimate that was produced out of that paper was 173 teragrams of carbon a year, a uh, rough estimate in, uh, in these coastal environments. And that's a trillion uh, grams. So what about Oregon's kelp? Um, I've been mentioning the bull kelp mostly, but we do have some giant kelp here, the macrocystis, uh, you, that you typically associate with Southern California, the kind of classic kelp forest you see it like modern pictures of Monterey. Uh, but we do have some here. Uh, it mostly shows up around Cape Arago. Uh, and then the bull kelp is sort of our classic case that we tend to see a lot of here. And it's that one that I was just talking about that has sort of like the one year life cycle and, it, and is it currently undergoing some pretty significant declines in several areas. So here's a map where we, uh, we have got some data here and I should uh, pause here and thank my collaborators, uh, Sarah Hamilton, who's a PhD student at OSU, who's currently focusing on kelp forest ecology and also Sarah Graven, I'll be showing some uh, some of her uh, some of her work that she's done around uh, sunflower sea stars. Uh, so this is uh, Sarah produced this map using some remote sensing data that she did uh, as part of her PhD. 
So you notice that um, the map is pretty focused on the south coast, and that's for a reason. There's a lot of rocky habitat here in this part of the coast. And so uh, that rocky habitat is a prerequisite because the kelp has to uh, produce the hold fast that attaches it to the bottom, and it needs something hard to hang on to. Uh, it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't do well in sandy bottomed habitat, and it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't do well just floating around. It kind of needs that stability. But uh, if you look up north, here's some data that was uh, put together from surveys that were done by ODFW between 1996 and 2011, and you can see some pretty significant kelp beds uh, just around Depot Bay, and there's a couple others uh, north of there. And I'll show you another map of the, rest, the experimental restoration project we're working on. And I'll show you some other areas. But just want to uh, make sure I'm being clear that even though we focused a good, a good amount on the south coast, the kelp forest and kelp beds do appear up and down the coast, uh, just not in, such, not in such large concentrations. But here's one where there is a pretty significant amount uh, here off Depot Bay. So now I want to uh, talk a little bit about this, uh, what we've started to come to talk, uh, speak of as a sort of perfect storm for Oregon's kelp forests and what, why we think we're seeing some of the changes that we're seeing. Uh, so I know that you guys have uh, talked to uh, or had a presentation from at least the folks from the Alaka Alliance. And the Alaka Alliance is a partner in the Oregon Kelp Alliance, and we work uh, we work very closely together. And we talked a lot about sort of the relationship between the uh, potential reintroduction of sea otters and what's going on right now in terms of the kelp forests. Uh, so I think it's important to incorporate this history into the conversation because it occurred a really long time ago. So it's really hard to draw a direct line between what happened then and what's going on very recently. But what is clear is that sea otters are a top predator in intact kelp forest ecosystems. And as you can see there, that, that otter with the two sea urchins, um, you know, they eat sea urchins when they're available and when they have uh, healthy uni in them or roe or gonads as we say. So the, uh, so the loss of those otters uh, sort of eliminates a top predator from a functioning ecosystem. And that kind of sets the stage for what comes a comes hundred or so years later. And one of the things that comes much later is sea star wasting. Many of you have probably heard about this in the 2013-14 or so. We saw a sea star wasting disease kind of rip through sea star populations and communities up and down the west coast of North America. And that included these, sim these sunflower so uh, sea stars, we sometimes call Pycnopodia. And in these photos, you're seeing a healthy one to the left. And in the middle, you're seeing one that's wasting. And uh, I don't know if you've seen this, but you know they really kind of just deteriorate. Their, their arms kind of fall off or even literally crawl away from their body. It's pretty uh, jarring to see. And here to the right, you can see one that's devouring a sea urchin. So here is another top predator uh, in, a, in an intact kelp, kelp forest ecosystem that plays a role in controlling the populations of sea urchins. And when they're not around, like, like having the otters not around, now you've got two uh, really important players in that system that are absent. And of course that uh, introduces an imbalance in that system. And then a couple of years later, you probably heard about the warm blob that was persistent off the coast of our, off of our coast. And that warm water uh, spells trouble for kelp. Uh, the kelp really needs that cold, nutrient rich water in particular. Uh, that's really the most important thing is that it needs nutrients. All, those, all that growth really comes from nutrients that are, that are drawn out of the water itself. So when you've got this really uh, persistent blob of warm water pushing against the, the near shore, it's having a direct effect on the capacity of the kelp to, to flourish and grow. And so you have uh, the kelp taking a hit that way. And now even more recently, we're seeing uh, these big 
uh, recruitment event essentially and big populations of purple sea urchins that are consuming kelp, they're herbivores, they eat the kelp, and uh, you end up with, uh, as you see in these photos, what, are, what are, have come to be called urchin barons. And that's just a, a way to describe uh, something where the kelp has been eaten or grazed down and the urchins remain. And you know they don't stop with the kelp, they eat the kelp, they eat the bull kelp and the macrocystis. They also eat the understory kelp and they'll even start to consume other organisms on the bottom and will literally uh, scrape anything that they can sink their teeth into and some, place, some places all the way down to bare rock. So I think barren is a really good um, and apt description of what is left behind. And what we, what we are left with is what we refer to as an alternate stable state ecosystem, where in a healthy, balanced kelp forest ecosystem is considered stable, even though there are interannual fluctuations, there are players in place that help to maintain that balance. And uh, once, that, once that flips, as we say, to an urchin barren, that also represents an alternate stable state where it becomes very difficult for that system to re revert back to a healthy kelp forest. And I'll talk a little bit more about what we might, what we're, some of the things we're doing to, to change that in some places. So here I just want to draw a few visual comparisons between kelp forests, because we, I think the word forest is a good metaphor, or a good descriptor, and then uh, sort of the terrestrial experience that we have and that a lot of you guys are focused on. So here's a shot uh, from about 2007. Uh, this was out of a Lenfest uh, study. So it's just a just a photo of a nice, healthy kelp forest. You know, you can see, you know, understory kelp and, and canopy kelp and fish swimming around. It looks nice and vibrant and healthy and diverse. And this is a shot that I took about a year ago uh, nearby, just south of Mount Humbug, where what used to look like that like the previous photo now looks like this. And clearly there's not much in the way of biodiversity there. It's pretty much a carpet of sea urchins. And I like to sort of draw the, the sort of comparison to the terrestrial kind of version of that. And one way that I sort of try to explain this to folks who haven't seen it is, you know, to look at this sort of healthy, temperate rainforest ecosystem where you've got this sort of diversity, uh, the sort of a the three dimensional structure of it, and uh, you know that looks really nice. I like the look of that, and uh, I think it has lots to. Uh, there's a lot to say about the, the health of that system, and that by and then to compare that to what it looks like in uh, a clear cut situation, where you've lost all of that sort of structure and diversity, and you've just got that sort of sort of uh, barren environment. So that's just sort of a one way to kind of think about these things in relationship. I, it's not always easy to draw those comparisons, but that's one way to visualize it. So um, back to this question, uh, this, this, con this uh, topic of the sort of perfect storm. I also think it's important to acknowledge that, um, you know, we're still learning and we don't know everything that's going on. We're still trying to figure it out. And here are some graphs, again, uh, that Sarah Hamilton put together as part of her PhD. And what you're seeing are some data that were uh, put together based on some remote sensing data, showing you a few different kind of pictures. On the upper left, you see at Cape Arago, up the, the north of this map, where there's some fluctuation uh, up and down, good years, bad years, but uh, no real observable general trend. And then you look at uh, both redfish rocks and Orford Reef, and Orford Reef in particular. But both of, in both of those cases, you can see uh, a pretty clear downward trend in the recent years, particularly the last, say, decade or, or more. Uh, so you can see that loss, and I can certainly attest to that personally, just based on my own observations of both of those sites. And then you go off Gold Beach and look at Rogue Reef, and you see a very different picture where uh, there appears to still be 
a pretty substantial and healthy kelp bed there. Uh, and that's, that's where the urchin divers are working now. Uh, but, you know, we're going to have to keep looking and keep watching, and I'll say more about that later. But that's just uh, important to just, to just sort of flesh out that uh, it's not a homogeneous scenario, like, like it usually is that way in the natural world. So now I want to talk a little bit about this, um, the sort of under the heading of, okay, what do we do about all this? And one of the things that the Oregon Kelp Alliance has gotten active in this year is to establish a kelp forest, an experimental kelp forest restoration project. And we really started thinking about Nellie's Cove as a place to start because many of us had been uh, between researchers and ecotour operators and divers, and urchin divers, many had already sort of noticed things there and had interest and that was kind of our ground zero. Uh, so we started there, but then pretty soon we had other divers coming to us and saying, well, we're seeing things in these other locations. And so instead of a, a single site, we expanded the project to these five sites you see on the map from the Macklin Cove down in Brookings up to Cape Arago and then up north at Cape Lookout and at uh, what we've learned has historically been called Chief Kiawanda Rock, but also known as Haystack Rock, not the one in Cannon Beach, but the other one in Pacific City. So these are now all sites that have been included in a scientific take permit that is, we're using to structure this experiment. And I'll say a little bit about what we're, what's actually happening. Uh, so I'm gonna focus on the work that we did this summer at Nellie's Cove and use that as a way to talk about the project generally. And I'll start by acknowledging uh, the folks that have come, come to be known as the Kelp Forest Defenders. These are divers that have come uh, this summer, came to Nellie's Cove from as far as Seattle to Portland, or Eugene, Corvallis, uh, Newport, Grants Pass, and, uh, Brookings and other places, all uh, responding to a call for trained divers to come and help us with this experiment. And I'll get into the details of what that is, but I'd like to acknowledge these folks. Uh, to the left is Diana Hollingshead, who's the owner operator of Eugene Skin Divers and is now also the Oregon Reef Check Coordinator. And she is organizing the survey work that we're doing in advance of the culling work that you're going to be seeing. And another diver to the right, uh, Grant Hogan's a local free diver here in Port Orford. And uh, that picture is just to him demonstrating the urchin culling tool that we're using to remove these sea urchins. And then there's other divers in the, in the mix there. And uh, uh, it's been a pretty enthusiastic group. So just to, uh, Re recover just to sort of review really quickly. Uh, so we've got all these stressors. Uh, we talked about climate change, uh, the uh, impact of pollution, uh, potentially of runoff, how that affects the health of the kelp forest. These help these top predators that are that are lacking at these at this point, and then uh, these these urchins. And I won't read that quote to you, but I'll just point out to you. Uh, this, uh, the most recent survey work that was done by the ODFW shellfish program at Orford Reef and Redfish Rocks. And these numbers came specifically from Orford Reef, uh, seeing a 10,000% increase in purple urchins over, uh, since the last survey had been done five years prior. And then uh, Scott Growth at ODFW had uh, estimated uh, a number, uh, three, a pretty alarming number of 350 million purple sea urchins at Orford Reef. So that's pretty jarring to think about. And there's in, there, in no way is anyone trying to say that doing any of this work is uh, scalable at that scale. But what we are considering is the importance of uh, re restoring and maintaining at least these oases of kelp forests that could continue to produce spore, wild spore from kelp that could reseed areas where we've lost uh, kelp forest for significant areas. Uh, and then I've sort of explained those other two photos. Well, one of those is from Cape Arago, the other is from Nellie's Cove. 
So with all of this, uh, you know, what are our options? Obviously, we've got to do more research. There's a lot we don't know yet. Uh, this, these targeted urchin removals that we've started to do at Nellie's Cove, and I'll show you some of the numbers on that. Uh, we've been talking about uh, the sea stars, potentially, potentially recovering sea stars or uh, cultivating or reintroducing them. Uh, obviously, you've heard from the Alaka Alliance and uh, that initiative to potentially reintroduce sea otters has, uh, is one of the components of the picture. Uh, we're thinking about kelp seeding and outplanting, and there are many other potential steps. But uh, the important thing is to really think about this in a systems, using a systems approach and thinking about the kelp forest as an ecosystem and uh, that has these multiple different kind of players and how do we sort of organize ourselves to address all of them. So this summer, uh, we focused our work at Millie's Cove, as I mentioned. Uh, these photos are just sort of showing you the comparison uh, between 2017 and, two 17 and 2020, uh, where there was ample kelp, and then in five years, there was none. Uh, it's one of the priority sites that I showed you earlier. And then I think it's also really important to emphasize that this, these, this is an experiment and we're using a classic before after control impact uh, study design that's pretty familiar with a lot of uh, ecological studies like this. So the first step was to survey the area and here is Nellie's Cove where we sort of had a nice neat way to divide it up into a, a treatment area and a control area. The treatment area is on the left, the control area is on the right, and the transects are those that were uh, surveyed by reef check, and there were additional scientific surveys done by uh, Sarah Hamilton and Dr. Aaron Galloway at OIMB as part of another project. And so uh, those numbers are just showing you the, the results of those surveys, uh, pretty high densities of urchins and uh, no kelp. So uh, we worked with ODFW, shellfish pro, uh, sorry, shellfish program to develop a scientific take permit. And as I mentioned, we're using a, a backy, a backy experimental design and working with local folks to help coordinate the effort. Uh, the surveys conducted by Reef Check Oregon uh, focused for the purposes of this experiment, focused on urchins, red and purple kelp, red and flat abalone, and sunflower sea stars. I haven't really mentioned abalone yet. But they're definitely a player, and uh, abalone populations, as many of you might know, are uh, significantly in decline, and harvest is uh, completely off the table at this point for foreseeable future. And there's a lot of concern about those populations. One of the reasons for that is that uh, abalone compete with urchins for food. And right now, they're, they're not winning that battle. A couple of other things we are doing as part of the project is monitoring uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the reproductive status of the urchins. So we're, sam we're sampling urchins each time we go out to do this survey work or the culling work and measuring the what's called the gonadal index, which is, which is a ratio of gonadal weight to body weight. And that's one way for us to measure the reproductive status of the urchins. And the other thing we're doing is measuring dissolved oxygen using sensors uh, during, before, during, and after the culling events. So we can uh, detect any potential effect of this work on uh, dissolved oxygen levels. We certainly don't wanna see, you know, create another problem. So here are some statistics from the work we did this summer. Uh, we did three weekends in June, July, and August. Uh, during, that, during those three events, which were basically all weekend events with multiple trips with dive teams of four or six going out to the cove in two hour shifts for two days. And uh, we brought about 30 divers made a trip here or were already here. And many were repeats. So that, that those 30 divers, um, uh, you, would pro you could probably make that more like 50 or 60 because many came multiple times or every time. Over, over those three weekends did about 99 actual dives and spent about 74 hours underwater. And in the process cleared 
uh, area of about 2,700 square meters, or a, around a third of the area that we were focused on. And in the process, uh, culled 46,700 urchins and also invested about $7,000 in the local economy through, uh, uh, sorry, through uh, boat charters, uh, lodging and travel for divers and equipment. And uh, we also made sure that uh, the hungry divers were well fed and we were super grateful to commercial fishermen who donated fish to the project, as I mentioned earlier. So the map is showing you sort of the, uh, the color. It, the color is ba basically showing the density or the number of urchins culled in each of those transects. And that was based on diver counts. And then the triangles are showing you the location of the sensors we deployed to measure dissolved oxygen. So what we learned this summer that uh, we, you know, we carried off a pretty meaningful experiment at one of the sites and we developed and refined our protocols. We're really seeking to develop best practices for this kind of work. We built a, a good network of pretty enthusiastic divers and uh, generated an increase in awareness of kelp forests and the need, the need for the kelp, uh, the importance of the kelp forests and what, what's going on and what the threats are. And we done, we've also done additional surveys and observations about the ecology of Nellie's Cove and invested money in the local economy. And a project that I didn't mention yet, but, I, but I'm going to now, is a Sea Grant project that was funded this year, uh, uh, sorry, for uh, a, a Sea Grant project focused on the relationship between gray whales and the kelp forest. I haven't really mentioned whales that much, but there is a direct relationship there that uh, really travels from the kelp through the food that the whales eat, the mycid shrimps that are attracted to that kelp habitat, and the whales that eat that food. And so there's a lot of interest in that relationship. And that, fun, that project was funded this year uh, and led by Dr. Lee Torres and Dr. Aaron Galloway from OIMB. And so uh, some of the survey work that was done at Nellie's Cove and nearby was done as part of that project. So not only are we learning about all the things I've already talked about, but all of the other sort of players in this ecosystem, because there's a lot of kelp species that I haven't really talked about much but there's a lot of understory kelps and other species that are part of that system too, and uh, they all matter. So I'm just gonna show you a couple other maps of the other sites. Here's the Chief Kiwanda site map, uh, showing you a similar one, uh, similar to the one I showed you of Nellie's Cove, showing the treatment and control area and the survey transects that were uh, done by reef check. And uh, again, finding high urchin densities and very little kelp or none. And here is the map for Macklin Cove, and those are the two. Those two sites have now been surveyed and have been added to our experimental sites under the scientific take permit. ODFW has reviewed the data. We all agree that it's suitable for us to proceed with this work. And last weekend, we did have a team of divers deploy at Macklin Cove and started the work at the at the site there. And the folks up north are just waiting for a weather window at this point. And of course, this time of year, that will be a challenge. Uh, there is one more site up at Cape Lookout uh, that was also identified by local divers as a uh, place, of, place that's had a kelp forest in the past and currently is not very, uh, they're seeing declines there, I'll say. So we still have to do uh, additional survey work there, but uh, we're working on that. Cape Arago is a little bit different because what we're finding there is a pretty heavy population of sea urchins, but also some very uh, rich kelp forests that are still there. So we're doing uh, more work. Some of the work that Aaron Galloway is doing under the seed project is being done there. And we're, uh, ReefCheck did do the surveys there and we're currently just analyzing those data. So stay tuned on that. I mentioned the sea stars. Uh, so one of the things that's being explored right now is potentially raising them in captivity and potential for reintroduction or enhancing uh, these uh, Pycnopodia populations as another way to, to contribute to a healthier ecosystem. 
And uh, at this point, I'm just going to wrap, very briefly cover a few things that we're uh, that are currently in the works that we're planning for the coming year, and then I'll kind of wrap it up. We can take questions. Um, so one of those I'm really excited about this. Uh, C Grant uh, has recommended for funding an experimental project uh, co-culturing edible dulse, which is that seaweed you might have heard about that some people say tastes like bacon. I'm not so sure, but uh, it is being cultivated by two commercial operations at Port, in Port Orford and at Vanden. And the project will co-culture it by, <clears throat> by growing the dulse and feeding it to purple sea urchins to fatten up their uni to make them uh, marketable. So stay tuned on that. That project will unfold in the coming year, assuming it's funded. And then uh, I mentioned that ReefCheck hired a coordinator, Diana Hollingshead, and it's been great working with her. And we're also working with ReefCheck to uh, develop an expanded training program that will incorporate a kelp forest restoration diver specialty. And we're partnering with all the different dive shops that are partnering on this project. So be on the lookout for that. And we're really, with that project, one of the things we're looking to do is really make it more inclusive and create more opportunity for those who are interested in diving and participating in projects like this, but may not have had that opportunity. And then uh, we're really excited about uh, potential funding through a congressional appropriation that is currently in the appropriations bill and really grateful to uh, uh, sorry, Senator uh, Jeff Merkley and his staff for really acknowledging the importance of this work and being willing to fund a kelp forest survey that if we if it's funded hopefully it will be funded and it'll happen uh, next year 2022. So those are some of the exciting things that we're looking forward to. Uh, that was a lot to cover. I hope I didn't use up too much of your time and I'm happy to take questions and before I do that I just want to acknowledge uh, Oregon Sea Grant and the Pew Charitable Trusts and the Oregon Wildlife Foundation have all uh, contributed funding to different aspects of these projects. And I'm really looking forward to this and doing more and, uh, and to answering your questions. Oh, and one last thing, if you, uh, you can learn more about us, go to OregonKelp.com, look for us on social media at Oregon Kelp. And if you missed it, there was a great piece that OPB did on their super abundance series on sea urchins. And they did, a, I think, a pretty good job of kind of laying out all the different aspects of this thing we've been talking about in an interesting, enjoyable way. So I hope you can, you'll check that out. And uh, with that, I will give it back to the organizers. And thanks again for having me. And uh, hopefully I can answer some of your questions. Great, thank you, Tom. Give it a little clap there, a little golf clap. There we go. All right, so um, let's see. I'll just uh, start with some of the questions here in the chat box. So Dennis asks, uh, why weren't the kelp beds uh, around Depot Bay um, included in the five research sites? Good question. Um, I just stopped sharing my screen, so if people wanted to come on come on screen, they can. Uh, so the yeah, so I guess the there I can, I'm going to answer that two ways. One, uh, the project really kind of uh, emerged in or in a pretty much a kind of organic way. Uh, you know, we really were starting with the focus at Nellie's Cove with what we kind of were already aware of and ready for. And, but very quickly, a lot of divers just started to kind of emerge. They just kind of like came out of nowhere and just said, what about this place? What about that place? And that's where these other four sites got added. And frankly, we didn't have that conversation about Depot Bay. But I'm really interested in exploring that. What I'm hoping is that this experiment is gonna lead us to a place where we've developed essentially best practices. And the goal is to get, uh, we hopefully get the, comp to get the funding to do the survey and use that survey work to identify where are these other places where we need to pay attention. And I think Depot Bay would be one of those places where we should take a closer look and see what's going on there and whether there's a need to intervene there and do more work. So thanks for bringing that up. I'm glad that, you know, I've actually been up there and dove it. And I think it's it's a really impor important habitat for kelp forests. And we definitely don't want to leave it behind. 
I'll follow up with another uh, question from Dennis. I'm sensing Dennis might live in Depot Bay. Um, have there been any measurements of the decline in the kelp beds at Depot Bay? And how does it compare with the point south? And he says, from the surface, it appears that the beds are very diminished. Yeah, well, first of all, thank you for sharing that. Um, one of the things we'll be doing if the survey project gets funded is uh, the, it'll be very intentionally a very uh, community oriented project. So we are hoping to uh, not only work with divers, but also with drone pilots, and kayakers, snorkelers, anybody who might be interested in and ready to help with help us all take, a, you know, keep a better eye on what's going on with our kelp forest, not just a one off, but an ongoing monitoring protocol. So uh, stay tuned. Uh, I think you might have an opportunity to participate in something like that if that should get funded. Um, to answer your question directly, I can tell you that part of Sarah Hamilton's work was to analyze the remote sensing data for the entire coast. And so I'm pretty sure that she does have some data, some Depot Bay data. So if, uh, if, if someone wants to capture your email or if we can get connected somehow, um, maybe I can put my email in the chat. If anybody wants to reach out to me, I'm happy to do that. And I can definitely connect you directly to Sarah and she can share what she's got from that, uh, from that area. Great, I think that's a great way to um, get connected there. And then I, I just say, Tom, if, if that does get funded and you, you wanna get the word out, we can definitely help spread the word out to our group as well through our email list and, and all that kind of stuff. So keep us in mind when, um, hopefully when that comes through, that's all I'll say. Yes. When? <laughs> so a couple questions from uh, Jim here. Um, uh, are you saying there's a cause and effect between the sea otter decimation and sea star wasting disease or just a regrettable coincidence? I, that's a really good question. Uh, I would have, it would be hard for me to imagine an effect that would occur a hundred years later, uh, but I think you've got a, essentially a way I think about it is like taking the sea otters out of the system becomes a, a sort of a precondition to what happens much, much later. Even though it's, you know, you may have a difficult time. I have a difficult time drawing that line, that hundred year line and tracing it from here to here. But I think it's really important to acknowledge that that was a, precursor to the situation that emerged over the last five years. But I'm not sure how, I, I, to be frank, I don't know, I'm not a real expert on the, what went on, what, what, what happened there with the sea star wasting. I know there's been lots of talk about temperature having something to do with it, about, um, you know, a disease agent having a, having a role in it. Um, and the, like why one species would not recover when others have is it's it's really uh, I think we're I think we're all still scratching our heads to try to figure it out. So sorry to kind of cop out on that one a little bit, but I'm not going to make stuff up. <laughs> I think I think that's that's the right that's the right way to go. <laughs> so uh, Jim's other question was uh, a lot of greenies propose that we just need more kelp and all of our climate change will be solved. I feel like there is no natural environment that is not optimized on most levels given its current constraints. Is there that much room in the ocean ecosystem to sequester that much carbon compared to what is already buffering? Thanks. Uh, well, I think that's a great question. I, I guess I would basically agree that um, uh, it, it, when it comes to climate change and carbon sequestration and all of that, I think it's uh, personally, my, my take on it is that I think it's smarter to pursue many paths, <laughs> as they sometimes say in some circles, people talk about many paths to the top of the mountain. Um, I don't think there is a silver bullet personally, and I don't think we should put all our eggs in one basket, not to be overuse metaphors here, but I think the folks that, uh, there's a group called Drawdown that I think, I think has done a great job of kind of inventorying all the different ways that we can affect this, uh, this issue. 
And I, I think it's wise to embrace as many, as many ways as we can and create as many opportunities as we can. And I would certainly not say that the only answer to climate change is kelp. I would definitely not say that. But what I would say is that given what we know about the importance of that, all you know, the, how fast it grows and how much carbon it sucks up, I don't think it's a good idea to ignore it and let it go away. Because I think that's, that's definitely playing a role uh, beyond all the ecological roles that it plays. Definitely playing a role there. So I think it would be wise to at least invest in seeing what we can do to not have it all go away, uh, but certainly not over invest or become sort of obsessed with it like it's the, it's the holy grail. A piece of the puzzle, if you will. Yeah. So a couple questions here from Shannon. Uh, during the peak of the sea star wasting, was there any impact to the presence slash abundance of urchins? You mentioned an increase in abundance. Are you saying this was attributed to the die off of sunflower sea stars? Wasn't there a few notations of wasting impacting urchins also? Yeah, wow. Okay, a couple of things to unpack there. Um, uh, again, so first I'll step back and sort of go back to the, the, the sort of the perfect storm uh, metaphor where we're talking about the history of otters being gone and the warm blob and the sea stars dying off and the urchins just having some good years and kelp having bad years. So you end up with the, it's a very complex equation, right? I don't think you can say that the only reason you have all these uh, urchins is because you lost the sea stars. Um, because I think you just got like different, uh, almost like orders of magnitude there, but they're a player. I think it, they played a role for sure uh, based on what we know, but probably not at the scale. In other words, if the sea stars didn't die, uh, would that be the one thing that would have changed the equation so we wouldn't have the situation we have? I don't think so, but it's definitely a contributing factor. And then I think the other question you had was whether or not urchins experience wasting disease of some kind. And I'm gonna say yes to that. There is something that's called black spot disease. And I've actually seen that uh, as an urchin diver and as a, as a researcher. In fact, we saw a few examples of that in the urchin barrens where we were working this, this summer at Nellie's Cove. So the urchins do experience uh, diseases, they may not have the same ideology or the same origin, but uh, you know, it's not hard to imagine what happens in a population of animals that are all kind of collectively starving together and they're in very close quarters. Uh, we've seen evidence, we've seen examples of, of populations of animals in that kind of situation getting sick in the past. And we certainly have seen that in urchin populations, uh, but not, uh, not to the, the extent that we've seen in the this whole sea star wasting epidemic. I think it's, it's a, I think it's pretty sure it's a different disease, but definitely there is some, uh, some disease that emerges in urchin populations too. So I think, I think I covered the questions you asked. Sorry if I missed something. She has more, so just, just hold tight. So the okay. other, <laughs> her other uh, question was, she, she missed what you mentioned about understory kelp or additional kelp, so, so you may have mentioned it. Uh, but have you seen an increase in other canopy kelp species like Alaria uh, increase or de decrease abundance to take place for giant or, or, bull, or bull kelp? Uh, so what I'm going to, again, I'm going to sort of, I'm going to uh, bow a little bit to people in the group that know more than I do, people like Dr. Aaron Galloway, but I know based on my conversations with him, uh, I'll say two things. One is that I think it's really important to acknowledge that there is this complex ecosystem, just like you wouldn't say a forest is comprised of just trees, that there's, you know, as you saw in that picture and you see in, in life when you walk around in the forest, it's not just the trees, you got the, the shrubs and you've got the ferns and the mushrooms and everything else. And so uh, that's something that's pretty important. And what I, tr what I, one of the things I'm trying to do is to not Hyper focus, even though we are spending a lot of time talking about bull kelp because of its properties and it being a foundation species and creating this 
three-dimensional habitat, but I, I try not to uh, forget that there are these other species and they're part of the system too, and that that's important. Um, but clearly when you look at an urchin baron, you're not just losing the bull kelp, everything's being munched down. So the urchins are not discriminating in that way. Uh, as far as the question about things shifting, other species uh, taking over, um, I haven't honestly heard much about that. I know, as I mentioned, that there is some macrocystis and at Cape Arago, and actually Sarah Hamilton was sharing some aerials that she did up there using a drone. And we were looking at those, and uh, one of the things we're gonna be doing is using that drone footage to uh, come up with answers to some of those questions, like is that, is that you know, feather bow kelp or which species are we looking at here? And that'll be one of the things we'll do as part of this survey uh, when it gets funded. So I, I appreciate the question. It's a really good one. And I hope we can learn more about all that as we go forward. Great. All right, a couple questions from Bill. Um, I think he's he's talking about kind of since the worst of the wasting disease stuff a few years back are has, are there are the sea stars showing a, a any indication of an increase in population? So I'll break that down based on what I know, and that is that many sea star species have rebounded uh, pretty remarkably. The, the the ones we typically see a lot of the pisaster, the ochre sea star, uh, they're doing pretty well in a lot of most places we're seeing them. We're seeing other, other species. You might have noticed a couple of them in a few of the photos. Um, so yeah, good news for a lot of sea stars. But in the case of the sunflower sea star, the Pycnopodia, uh, not so good news. Although, uh, you know, I think I had the, I think the number was in that slide, something like 90% of the population had been lost. But re very recently, uh, and maybe in part because we're doing more diving, more research, more surveys, uh, we've, we've uh, found them. They're, you know, here and there, we're getting these reports and they're not, 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 not all tiny ones. They're pretty good sized, you know, adult ones that, you know, we're not sure what's going on there. Are they returning from deeper water? Maybe, maybe they were seeking refuge when the water was so warm. Not sure, but it is encouraging to see these, uh, these uh, sea stars showing up. And uh, I don't think we're back, back in the game like the way it was before, uh, but those are hopeful signs anyway. Great, and Bill's other question was, uh, do Dungeness crabs eat sea urchins? Not that I'm aware of, good question. But there is another animal that does, and I didn't bring this up, but it's one of my favorites and that's the wolf eel. And uh, wolf eels will eat urchins. And in fact, uh, you'll find, uh, sometimes see them with uh, purple stains on their teeth because they've eaten so many urchins, they've actually absorbed that pigment and they've got like purple teeth and even in their, they'll, it'll be in their, like their bones and stuff. So yeah, Wolfields, Wolfields are an urchin eater. Um, not so many of them. So I'm not sure how many Wolf, wolf eels we would need to have around or that would even be a good idea but they're out there and they're they're munching on some urchins it's really important one of the things that's important to re realize is that when urchins are healthy and when they have food and they have umi inside the, the gonad or the you know the, that's the part that is uh, nutritious you know fatty and has nutrients and if you've ever been to the sushi bar and eat, eaten uni that's what you're eating and uh, you know they have that when they're healthy, and so that's why sea otters will seek them out. Why why wolf eels or whatever's eating them is going to eat them when they're in that balanced environment where they have food available. But once they're in an urchin bear and they've eaten everything, and they essentially go into basically a state of starvation, and they're pretty much kind of wither away inside, and now they don't really have anything to offer. And it's one of the things that's pretty challenging about this problem because they actually don't starve and die like many organisms do. They enter a state of uh, what we call torpor, a low state of a low metabolic state. And uh, they just kind of like sit there until some food comes around and they kind of wake up and eat it. And uh, part of the reason that's challenging is, you know, 
for any of these organisms, whether you're talking about wolf eels or the sea stars or the otters, you know, um, you know, they're, they're evolved to optimize, you know, the optimal foraging theory, you know, where they, they'll seek out the best food, they'll use the energy they need to get more energy from the food they eat. And what that means is that if an otter dives in an urchin bear and brings an urchin up to the surface and cracks it open, and there's no food inside, uh, the tendency of it, its tendency is going to be to move on and try to find a place where the urchins are, are nutritious. So that just adds another sort of a layer of challenge to all of this and when, why the urchin barren is such a persistent, as we say, stable state ecosystem. All right, couple, uh, couple part question here from Debbie. I'll, I'll get it, it all in one question here. Um, can you talk about the difference between red and purple urchins? It sounds like the red urchins are marketable, but the purple ones are the ones that have exploded. Is it known why that might be? Yeah, I'll break that down a little bit. Uh, so the red sea urchin is definitely, has been the commercially valuable species, uh, mainly because of, uh, more or less because of size. They're typically larger. And so the uni is bigger, much easier to market and uh, you know, process and produce. And uh, it's just been the, the thing that has ended up in the market in our part of the world. In other parts of the world, there are other species. There's green sea urchins on the East Coast and there's other species, I think, in Japan. But uh, that's been our go-to urchin for the market. The purple urchin hasn't really been very valuable in the market, mostly because of their size. Uh, so it's a lot of work and it just doesn't pencil out sort of economically. Uh, so that's pretty much why that one has been the marketable one and the other one hasn't. They are different species uh, and primarily the difference is size. You might notice uh, when you look at the red sea urchin, the spines tend to be longer and of different lengths and they also come in different colors. Even though we call them red, they might be pink, they might be red, they might be a dark deep purple. Whereas the purple urchins are all that same kind of purple color. They're typically shorter and a little bit uh, shorter spines, all uniform and kind of a flatter body shape and typically smaller, so you have smaller uni inside. But there are a lot of folks right now that are looking at um, making them, making that, uh, marketing them part of the strategy overall. So gathering or gathering purple sea urchins up, as I mentioned earlier in the, the sea grant project that we'll be working on, uh, that's already been piloted feeding, feeding seaweed to those urchins and raising them and then bringing them to market. So that, that's underway in a lot of places right now. There's a company called Urchinomics that uh, we're actually having some conversations with. They're very interested in the work we're doing and taking some of those urchins off our hands and making them marketable using uh, urchin feed that they developed in Norway. So kind of, kind of along that same line, you answered this a little bit, but um, can you tell us the commercial use of sea urchins and will the commercial interests support the introduction, reintroduction of sea otters? So I guess to, those are sort of two different questions in my mind. So the, I said a little bit just now about the commercial interests. So we talked about um, fattening up urchins and bringing them to commercial, into commercial use through that, that uh, avenue, working with chefs, bringing that purple sea urchin uni into the market that way. Uh, <clears throat> and then also we've been talking about uh, the, uh, the other thing to do is to uh, bring those urchins ashore and find ways to make use of those urchin bodies as compost. The, the test or shell is uh, mostly calcium carbonate. And uh, that's a nutrient that could be valuable for lots of different purposes for, you know, for soil, for soil amendments. So we're just beginning to look at that as another use. And then uh, the connection between that and the otter reintroduction, uh, I guess, you know, it's all connected. I'm not sure how it, I guess the best way I can answer that is to, to, I guess, to say kind of the things I'm saying now about how we have to think about it, the whole ecosystem and uh, the otters, if they are gonna be reintroduced are gonna be heavily dependent on a healthy kelp forest ecosystem. 
they're they're not they're really adapted to that system and so uh, you know i guess one way to think about that is that if you don't have that healthy kelp for us the otters are are they're going to be having a hard time uh, you know they're not going to they're not going to thrive in an urchin bear great so just a, a comment here from jim burke he says great job tom and the oregon coast aquarium will adopt the foul weather depot site <laughs> okay sounds good sounds good jim we'll definitely be talking about that that is one of the challenges uh, uh as anyone like jim who knows about doing this work uh one of the challenges is just you know getting out there to do the work uh here in oregon we you know we're up against a lot and uh we don't we don't have the luxury of just going out to sea anytime we want to we're pretty much at the mercy of of you know the sea and so we have to really think and be strategic about doing this work. So I really appreciate that, Jim. And uh, I'll definitely be following up with you on that. And he did add a little follow up here. He said the Oregon Coast Aquarium has a team of scientific divers that has worked up and down the coast on various projects, including the marine reserve sites along the coast since the marine reserve inception, a seaworthy vessel, and hundreds of dives off in the foul weather otter rock area over the last 20 plus years. Uh, our team is excited and uh, to participate and help. So it sounds like a good good connection there. Yes, Jim. <laughs> You'll be getting the invite to the next Oregon Cup Alliance meeting. We're talking all about it. <laughs> nice. Thank you so much. All right. Sarah says, really interesting and informative talk. Thanks. And then um, one last question here from Shannon. Um, let's see. Did you specifically mention how warming water temperatures and more acidic water chain uh, more acidic water change impacted kelp abundance uh yeah so uh, i guess the one that I, I i did mention and i'll reiterate now is that uh kelp thrives in cold nutrient rich water uh it grows using the nutrients that it essentially ext extracts from the water around it and uh, that cold water tends to be the nutrient rich water so when you have that persistent warm water, it's kind of starving the kelp out, basically. So that's why we think there's a direct relationship there between you know, that. It's, again, one of the factors, uh, the, the warm blob. That's why I kind of like this sort of perfect storm metaphor, because it's not one thing. It's multiple hits. It's the warm water and the otters and the sea stars and the urchins. And it's all coming together to create a a bad situation for the healthy kelp forests that don't thrive under those conditions. As far as acidification goes, uh, I think that it's, again, it's one of the ways that I think it's important to uh, sort of connect the dots when we're talking about climate change and sequest carbon sequestration and ocean acidification, in fact, because that is directly related to the amount of uh, carbon that's dissolved in the ocean. So if you've got a healthy kelp populations uh, that are drawing that carbon out of the ocean, that is going to have a positive effect on, um, you know, on, on the acidification issue and, and vice versa. If that's not happening, it's only making things worse. So uh, I think it's really important to make those connections. And, uh, you know, honestly, I think generally speaking, uh, this work has been super fascinating and exciting to get involved in. And to be honest, it's also uh, somewhat overwhelming because it is so complex because we really are talking about this whole forest ecosystem and there isn't a one, there's no one villain, there's no one hero, there's a system. <laughs> and it's challenging us to really, uh, and this is where I think uh, the Oregon Cup Alliance is uh, I think doing a pretty good job of bringing people together from so many different perspectives and coming to one place to really tangle with this complexity. And I think that if we're going to be successful at attacking and challenging and, and subduing these complicated problems, it's going to be through uh, a, a sort of a complicated approach to the solution. And, and that's nothing that anybody wants to really love or hear about but it's kind of the reality we're in. And I think that's the challenge of our day, our time. And uh, I really appreciate 
the fact that we've got just all this diversity in the room talking about this complicated problem and it's going like, well, let's talk about how these things all fit together and how do we move the, the machinery in, you know, all together, like toward some sort of solution and be ready to try different things. Perfect. Yep, I think we'll wrap it up there. And as, as I like to say about a lot of these ecological things, it's it's not rocket science. It's it's a lot more complicated than that. So <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> for sure. Great. Well, another round of applause for Tom. Thank you very much for spending your evening with us here up on the mid coast. And um, yeah, best of luck in, in all your ventures. And um, keep keep uh, in touch with us if you need to get the word out on some of those depot bay sites and. Uh, we look forward to uh, catching up with you sometime down the road and, and hearing more about your great work. So thank you for, again, and thanks to all of you for joining us this, this evening. Absolutely. Uh, I just want to thank you all again, especially uh, Tom at Cambridge. Thank you for uh, inviting me and uh, pulling me into your world here. It's been great spending time with you guys. Really great questions. And uh, especially, Jim, thanks, thanks for reaching out. And I'm looking forward to getting engaged there at Depot Bay and uh, just spreading the, spreading the love. And uh, just invite you all again to go to OregonKelp.com and you can join our mailing list there so you can uh, find out more as things unfold and, uh, and we spread the news about what's going on. So thanks again. Thank you for the work you do. <laughs>